Well, so thanks everybody for showing up today. We have Emily from uh, Be the Beaky Beach YouTube channel. And I um, hope you uh, learned something today. Thanks for showing up. Thank you. So, how many first year beekeepers do I have in the crowd? We're not okay. beekeepers. We're yet. not yet. Okay. We're not yet. Not yet. <laughs> All right, awesome. So, the rest of you are like two years, three years in? You guess so? Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. So, the first thing I'm going to go over then um, is the most important thing where are you going to get your bees and what kind of bees do you need to want to get? So, there's a couple different options that you can do when you look for your bees. You can either get them in a package, it's going to look like this. It'll be three pounds of bees, and then it'll come with a queen in a little cage that looks like this with um, a screen on it and a little candy cork on it. That's so that she has something to eat. And then um, typically there will be a little plug on one side that you will remove once you do get your package, and she will eat through that, and the other bees will eat through it on the other side to release her. And then your other option when you do get bees is also to get them in a nuke. Now for a new beekeeper, this is my favorite way to start beekeeping just because this is essentially a mini beehive. So it's already started. They already have a bunch of frames drawn that they can start working from versus the package. It's just a pretty much a swarm of bees. So they're starting from absolutely nothing when you're putting them in a hive with no comb. So typically it comes with uh, five frames and one frame will be of honey. That's what it looks like. It's everybody sees. <laughs> um, and then you also have some brood frames in it. So brood frames, if you don't know what those are for the new beekeepers, are that's where all of the baby bees, all of the eggs, all of the larvae, that's where your next generation of bees are going to come from is those brood frames. And then it'll also come with pollen um, and then also a laying queen as well. So that is another reason why I like nucleus colonies because you already know that this queen is laying and she's gonna be successful. This colony accepted her, they're gonna keep her thriving. Whereas with a package, she's not laying yet. She was before she got put in here, but there is some risk to her maybe in the travel, she's not gonna be as good of quality, she's not gonna lay as well. Um, at least for a new beekeeper, it's just a little bit more of a risk. Now, if you're going into your second or third year though, for a package of bees, that is your best next best option because you already have all of this drawn comb. So you can just throw some bees in there and they can just get straight to work because they don't have to do all the work anymore. Um, and then there is one other option that I've been starting to see lately and that is like a 10 frame deep. I'm sure some people have seen those for up for sale online. And just for a new beekeeper from my own perspective, beekeeping, like you're all gonna find your own methods and how you do things and as you learn and grow in beekeeping. And just what, in my opinion, what I've noticed is with 10 frame deeps for a new beekeeper, you're gonna be getting a 10 frame deep that is going to pretty much be completely set up and ready. And for a new beekeeper, you're like, oh, hey, that's perfect. I can just put them there, not have to think about them. Only thing is, is they're farther ahead in their season. So you're gonna have to do more splits. You're gonna have to watch for swarming. You're gonna have to know all of that information if you're going into that route. So that's why I suggested me. Um, and then on to equipment. So I'm just gonna go over the complete basics as if you know nothing about beekeeping equipment. So this is what a normal hive looks like. This is what we call a deep box. You'll see it be um, a little bit taller than you'll see this box up here. And this is what we usually call a honey super. We'll call it a medium. We'll call it the honey box. There's so many names for it. Um, I don't know why we made so many names for it. But the deep box is typically where you're gonna see all of your broods. So this is where they're gonna keep the main cluster of bees. They're gonna produce all of their baby bees, lay all of their eggs. And they're gonna build up from there and start filming, forming honey in like a arc around them and grow up as they bring in honey. Um, typically you'll also see that they'll have pollen frames and they like to put those on the outsides of the, of the hive. They kind of use it as like a block for them as like this is where the end of the colony will be. So wherever you see a pollen frame, typically that's where they'll stop their brood. Um, and then this is called a telescoping cover. In the recent years, I've started to learn that I absolutely adore telescoping covers. And the reason for this is, so uh, my partner and I, we got some hives um, that were on pallets this year, like commercial beekeepers do. And those come with like the migratory lids that don't come over like bees do. 
And the problem we're finding is that these telescoping covers help prevent any moisture from dripping in the colony during the winter time. Because they form over the hive like this, any water that starts to drip down, it can't just like go up and go in. Whereas the migratory lids, they sit like this, so any crack you have, they're gonna start to flow inside the hive. Just a little fun fact there. And then we have, what's the other people? Um, so this is called an inner cover. A lot of times people use this as, they'll have like a little notch for an upper entrance. This will help with airflow in the colony. Also a great thing to have for overwintering is you wanna have the upper entrance. Um, more on that later though. But the, uh, so the, the, the honeybee colony, they're gonna produce a lot of heat when they're in there as they're vibrating their bodies. And so they're gonna have to constantly be trying to cool down the colony. So the way they do that is by sucking in air from the bottom when that comes in, they'll then push it back out from the top. They can still push it out the bottom, but that upper entrance helps out a lot with that. It also helps to give them another entrance area, especially if you have a lot of like honey supers on the hive, so that they don't have to all go out, go in and out this way. They can just go straight up here and go in that way. And then also a lot of them have like this little feeder hole. That's what this is for. So you can put it on your colony and then put something I mean, maybe not necessarily. Yeah, that'll work. Will it work? Yeah. Okay, I've never used something like this before. That's the new upgrade in Persian. Oh, cool, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is a feeder that you can put <coughs> sugar water in. And there's some little holes in here. I know in the back you probably can't see it, but they'll have like little teeny tiny holes in there. And you can put it on there and it'll form kind of like a drip system that the bees can like lick off of. And you could put like another box on top of here to then close it up so that nothing else could get to it. But a lot of these inner covers will have that built in so that you can still feed your, your hives. Um, because the other thing that you have to think about when you have telescoping covers is you don't have a hole in the lid. So then you're like, okay, well, how do I feed my bees? Um, you can feed them with something like this that goes on the bottom board. You'd put like a little jar in there and it'd be right there at the entrance. Um, personally, I'm not a huge fan of these just because then you're attracting other pests to the, the very front entrance of your beehive versus having something in the hive that only the bees can access. Nothing else can get in there. Okay, and then, so this is, like I said, your honey box, your honey super, your medium, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this one is a 10 frame honey super. So this is typically going to go on the very top of your hive. Um, now you've probably seen pictures of people that will do like two, two, deep, two deep boxes until they start putting on the honey super. If it is your first year of beekeeping, you most likely will not be able to build out your honey super just because they have to build out those two boxes. Um, for Michigan folks, I usually recommend just going with the two deep boxes because that top box is going to be where all of your winter stores are going to be. They need like 80 pounds of sugar or of, uh, of honey to make it through the winter time. So that's quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a bit. <laughs> and then, so we already covered the deep box. And then we get down to your bottom board. So this one's cool that it has like this landing pad right here. I don't have the privilege of having these cool kinds like this, but um, I just have like the, the typical ones that just have like the flat piece coming out. But so you have two options. You can either get something that has a screen bottom board like this one does, or you can get the solid bottom board. The perks about getting a screen bottom board is this is what you can use to do mite tests. So um, I've never performed it myself. I believe it's powdered sugar that you sprinkle on them, correct? Yeah. Yes, and then um, over the course of a couple days, you see how much the mites, or how many mites drop onto this. And um, you'll look into, I think it's like a two inch, is it one inch square? No, I think they're one inch squares. One inch squares, yeah. and how many uh, mites are in each square. Definitely look that up if you wanna go that route. Like I said, I've never done it that way, so. Just, the sugar method really doesn't work that well. It doesn't? You no. haven't found? Okay. Not as good as the other methods. Okay, cool. Good to know. Um, the other perk about this, though, is in the summertime, this helps out with cooling the hive a lot because they're able to have that fully open screen. 
to then be able to pull in any sort of um, air and then move it through the hive that way. We have overwintered with uh, open screen bottom board before as well, and I honestly didn't notice a difference. I did do a trial a couple years back of, there was one hive that had a solid bottom board, one hive that had the screen that was open, and the other one, I think I was also experimenting with how big of, a, of this I wanted to keep on there of an entrance. And the problem was, is all of them survived. So I don't know which is the best. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, uh, I guess one thing I, I will say that I did notice though, in the hive that had the screen bottom board, they did like to come up a little bit higher in the hive. Now I know in Michigan that it doesn't get super, super hot here. It gets hot, but it doesn't get as hot as like down south. So just keeping that in mind, um, it might not be something that's absolutely crucial you have to get, whereas down south, it'd be really beneficial for them. Um, another thing I used to like using with the screen bottom board is even if I don't do the mic check that I was talking about, just even like pulling this tray out and just saying, okay, do I see a lot of mites here? Maybe I should perform a mite check if there's a lot of mites on this bottom board, just as a precaution. All right, and then this is an entrance reducer. So in the summertime, you're gonna to wanna to have your bottom entrance completely open. That way they can pull in all of that air and keep the hive cool. And so they're also gonna be sending out a ton of bees to go get nectar and pollen and stuff like that. So you wanna have it wide open. But once we start getting towards the fall time, we have a problem with mice. We had a huge problem with mice this year. I don't know if it was because it was so wet last year, but there were just so many mice. Um, so these help keep them from coming inside because in the winter time, your hive is going to, your colony is gonna move up to the upper parts of the box. So if they're not in the bottom, they're not really protecting the hive from any mice coming in, especially if it's cold. So they'll just make home in there. And then this also helps with robbing because that's another problem. Bees like to rob each other, unfortunately. So um, this will help condense their entrance down so that they only have a little bit of an entrance. A lot of times you can put it down to this little one. So that they only have to defend that little tiny area versus this whole entire area from any robber bees coming in. Let's talk about frames next. And does anybody have any questions yet? The uh, feeder. Um, yeah. Sugar water feeder, is that something you have to do all year or all summer long? No, that's actually a great question. So that's something I didn't talk about. That is the other reason why I like nucleus colonies. So if you are a brand new beekeeper and you got a package of bees, you have to feed them, like no matter what. They're going into a colony that's gonna have an open frame with no comb drone on it. So in order for them to get going and find resources, they'll need the sugar. Now, once you start hitting your flow, which is usually around in May here in Michigan, um, they will be bringing in so much honey, they won't take down any sugar you give them. So all summer long, you don't really have to feed them until maybe like September, if they're light, if they don't have that 80 pounds I was talking about. frames so you have a couple different options so my favorite thing to go with especially for new beekeepers is a plastic frame um, it doesn't necessarily have to be completely plastic it can be something like this that has a plastic foundation that's what we call this piece right here is we call it foundation and it has like little like honey bee comb grooves cut out in it that gives them a base to start drawing from. And you want to make sure you're getting plastic foundation that is waxed. I have made that mistake before. Um, getting foundation that was not waxed whatsoever, they will start to draw what's called wonky comb. So instead of it all drawing out evenly across, it'll be like a patch here and a patch here and a patch here. And then that starts interfering with the comb on the next frame. And that becomes a really big problem when they start to form brood and whatnot. Um, and then if you do end up getting plastic foundation that's not waxed and you're like, hey, I'm just gonna wax it myself. I would suggest getting wax from a beekeeper because I got, when I first started, I got wax off of Amazon. They did not like that whatsoever. I don't know if it's just the type of wax that it was, but they still drew out that wonky comb. 
Um, but the reason that I like this is that it gives your bees a base um, and guidelines to work off of when they're brand new to the hive. When there's nothing drawn out in this hive and they have no idea what to do, this tells them where to start. So that's why I like plastic frames. Now, the other route that you can take, also these are uh, a lot more sturdy too. In the summertime, it gets really hot and so like the honeycomb will get kind of like almost as soft as like butter if it gets really hot. So when you go to like look at the frame and you, if you say have like a foundationless frame without this piece in the inside, then it could potentially fall out, which is another problem. So since we're talking about that, let's go over to wax foundation. So it looks like that one pops it. Okay. So there's two kinds. I've made the mistake and have gotten just plain wax foundation that didn't have wires, and that became a big mess. <laughs> they uh, chewed up all of the wax because when it got too hot, it started to like curve and like it wouldn't stay straight. So that's why there's these wires in it. If you're ever wondering, if you start looking into it. Now, one thing I noticed is they do draw this out faster, but it's not as strong as the plastic foundation. Um, and all it is is just natural beeswax with wires to help give them a little bit of support. And then if you ever get into comb honey, I see he has a sheet in here for comb honey. They make a super thin wax foundation that you can put in there too. So this is edible. That's why it's so thin and so light. But I actually do go ahead and pass this around just so people can see what, what wax foundation looks like. And then we also have, so then we also have something like this. So I'll probably pass these around just so you can see them up close. So this is called a drone frame. So there's two different kinds of bees in your colony. There's drone bees and there's worker bees. Worker bees are all female and then drone bees are only males. And the worker bees are pretty much the ones that do all of the work in your colony. They honestly, they even tell the queen what to do. They're running the colony. And the drone bees, pretty much all they do is reproduce and eat honey. <laughs> so in the fall time, you'll see that the bees, they'll actually kick them out in the winter time and you won't have any drones in your colony because they eat up too much resources. So they say, hey, get out, we don't need you. We'll see you next spring. Um, but there is frames, this is a drone frame that will produce only drone brood. And the purpose of this would be if you were to be breeding queens and you want more drones in the area, or if you wanna use this as a way to lower varroa mites. So you've probably heard about varroa mites. They're the big thing that everybody talks about in beekeeping. Um, one of the biggest pests that bees have. And they like drone brood because drone brood takes a couple days longer than normal worker brood to fully develop before they hatch. So that gives the varroa mites because they reproduce inside each um, at all the, the brood cells, it gives the varroa mites more time to produce more varroa mites. And then you have more coming out when that drone brood comes out. So the whole purpose of this is to trap the varroa mites in the drone brood and then to take it out before they hatch and dispose of it so that you don't have all those varroa mites hatching inside your colony. Any questions on that? Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'll pass these around so you can see the difference in the cells because drone brood will be, the cells will be bigger and you'll notice that in your colony once you start, once you do get bees and you start looking at them. Yep. Let's see, what else do I have up here? Oh yeah, here we go. So then if it's your first year of beekeeping, you don't really have to think about this yet, but if it's your second or third year, then you will have to start thinking about having a queen excluder. So there's two different kinds. There's a metal one, which are a lot more sturdy and they're a lot easier to remove. And then there's also plastic ones, which these can kind of be a pain because the propolis and beeswax will like cement them down and then you have to like pry them up and you're flinging bees everywhere and then bees get angry and yeah. <laughs> But the whole purpose of this is to keep the queen out of your honey box. So you would put this right underneath here, right in between the boxes, but of course all the way back onto the hive, um, because these little grooves are too small for the queen to get through, but the worker bees can still get through. Now, personal preference from what I've found is I like to have my bees build up all the comb first, 
before I put this on, only because I noticed they'll build it up a lot quicker. Whereas if I put this on and they still have to build out this entire box, I don't know if it's just them having to move through this. It just, it takes a little bit longer. But um, having brood inside your honey box can be a really big problem just because then you can't pull the whole entire box and it's, it makes it a little bit more complicated. So that's the whole purpose of this. And then we have, so this is a bee smoker. This will be something that everybody should get one. Trust me on this. Um, again, when I first started, I was like, oh, hey, they're just bees. I'll be fine. I don't need a smoker. You need a smoker. Trust me. <laughs> they can get kind of grumpy, especially when you first start. Um, you have to get used to hearing the buzzing of the bees all around you. It can be kind of stressful at first. So this will help keep them calm until you do get used to that. And then we also have a hive tool. I would definitely suggest getting two of them because you will lose one. <laughs> one will always be lost, I swear. Um, and personally, I always have liked the ones with the hook. So this hook makes it super easy that when you go in your hive, you can just go on the edge of the frame and then just like peel it up like this. It'll make it easy. You can just pull it right out. And then, so I'll talk about these. So... When you're beekeeping, the hardest thing is to pick up frames with thick bee gloves, at least for me personally. It's really frustrating. So I've been trying out different gloves to find what works the best that they can't sting through. And I found that these gloves, so they're Venom Steel, the Black Widow. I'll pass around one of these gloves. They're a little bit thicker. So the bees cannot sting through them. Now I have found if you're using the same pair of gloves for like weeks on end, I think they get a little bit thinner and at that point they will start to sting you through those. But, <laughs> and then, so, okay, I don't know what this is. I've never seen this. That's a mouse guard. Is this? Okay, so I've never used one. I should probably get one because, yeah, there was a problem this year. Um, so yeah, this is a mouse guard. <laughs> um, yeah, so it has like little little doors in it for the bees to go through. That's cool. And then, it's, then it slides too. It's adjustable it's like, for either eight or ten frame or whatever you want to use. Oh, really? Oh, wait, does it? The dark side goes up against the, the box. Oh, okay. Oh, that's nice. Of course, you would take out the insurance reducer first before that goes on. But oh, I see. Yeah. And the little screw the way hold out. it in place. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that reminds me then. Okay, eight frame versus 10 frame. That's another thing you're gonna start seeing. So this is a 10 frame hive. And the reason why there's a huge debate, at least I'm thinking that the reason why there's a huge debate between the two is that an eight frame is gonna be a little bit lighter to pick up. So if you're not very strong, it's harder for you to pick up a hive. An eight frame might be the best route for you just because like I said, it won't be as heavy. Um, personally, what I've found that Casey and I like to use is we like 10 frames. And the reason for this, say you wanna condense this hive down. You now have the option to put in what's called a feeder frame. So there's actual feeder frames you can put sugar water in that will take up the space of one to two frames. So you can shrink your hive down to an eight frame at any point if you want to. And it's still just that same weight. And then if the colony starts to get bigger, you just take out that feeder frame, put in more frames. And so it gives them that extra space without having to give them more boxes. So it just gives you like more playroom to do that with. Also, a lot of the standardized equipment is all 10 frame. So if you start with one, I would keep with that one. Cause it's gonna be a lot harder if you get some eight frame and some 10 frame, then you can't switch boxes back and forth and stuff like that. And then we also have so I also brought something. So small hive beetles, that is also a problem. Now I used to never take them seriously until this year. Um, again, I don't know if it's because we had like a wet summer, but they were just going crazy in our colonies this year. So there are these little tiny beetles. You'll see them at the top of your colony. The bees, they don't like them. So they'll push them up to the top of your hive. And most of the time they'll like congregate in like one corner of the colony. And they like to feed on all of their honey, all of their pollen, and they will just lay eggs everywhere they possibly can. And they'll form like little teeny tiny larvae that will just destroy the whole entire hive. It will turn it into slime. It's, yeah, it's gross. And it'll smell bad too. So to keep those at bay, they make things like this. This is called a beetle blaster. So this one's a lot better than the one I have. This one's a lot bigger. And what you would do is put in like olive oil or some type of like vegetable oil 
and then something to attract them in. So you could put in like apple cider vinegar, just that smell is gonna bring them in because it's sweet. The one thing that I'm experimenting with is, so this is just a little bit of polyester cloth. This is what a lot of commercial beekeepers use that we are recommended to try. So we're gonna try it this year. It comes in like a big, huge roll and you just cut like little squares of it, but the beetles will go into this and then their little feet will get stuck because it's like a really like, I want to say coarse fabric. I'll pass it around so you guys can see it. Um, but there's no way for them to get out. And you would typically put this on the bottom board just so that you get the small hive beetles the moment they walk into that hive. And then they also have beetle jails. They're the same thing as a beetle blaster, so you do the same thing with both of them. Oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> no, so these would actually, I like to put them at the very top where you would normally see the small hive beetles. Since they're already going to be congregating there, um, you put them in between two frames and yeah, they'll be right there. They'll smell them and they'll go in there and become trapped and not be able to crawl out. As long as you have the oil in there at least, <laughs> because the them is not slippery. All right. I guess let's talk about Varroa mites now. Ooh. <laughs> so thank you for printing this out. This will make it easy for uh, everybody to see what they are. So there's a little Varroa mite on the back of this bee, right where the right where its wing is. So I'll pass around so everybody can see it. But what they are is they're pretty much a little parasitic like bug thing. I think they call them like arachnoid or something like that. But they're a little mite that will live on the bee and suck out all of the bee's nutrients. They used to say that it fed on the bee's hemolymph, so it's blood, but now they're saying it feeds on their fat body. And the reason this is really bad is that fat body that they have is what helps them be able to survive throughout the winter time. So you want to keep your varroa mite levels low, especially when you start getting closer to um, when they're preparing for winter. So generally, I like to always say in August, this is the most important month that you want to see what your varroa mite levels are at. So you can do a mite wash. Do you have one of those? Yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty side there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they have a couple different kinds of containers. Um, but so what you would do is you'd put in a half a cup of bees and where you want to get your bees is bees that are on a brood frame because those are going to have nurse bees that are attending to the brood. So they're going to have most of the mites on them because that's where mites want to stay so they can jump in the brood to reproduce. So you get a half a cup of bees, you put them in here. You also put in, um, some people use rubbing alcohol. I've found that actually using um, water with like some Dawn dish soap in it works really, really good. Um, so I use that, I pour that in there and then you shake it like crazy. And then with this one, I think you, cause mine's a little different. You just flip it yep. and then they'll all come out. Yep. Okay. So then yeah, you flip it and then you'll see mites that will fall to the bottom. And then, so that's where you're gonna wanna count how many mites you have. So the reason I say a half a cup of bees is because that's what starts your equation to figure out, okay, what's your percentage of mites in this colony? Half a cup of bees is around like 300 bees or so. And so you want to see if you have less than 10. If you have more than 10 mites, then you're going to have more than a 3% level of mites in your colony and you're going to want to treat. Um, Around August though, I usually like to shoot for around like a 2%, anything around there I'm going to treat because the problem is, is that the mites, they like, they time everything perfectly with the bees. So as they're producing throughout the summertime, and it's gonna be hard to see, so I'll also pass this around. Um, so we have a line down here that's varroa mites and a line up here that's, that's honeybees. And what happens is the varroa mites slowly start coming up throughout the year, just constantly reproducing. But the honeybees, they shoot up all the way during the honey flow, and they're, they have really, really high levels of bees. This gives the mites a really good opportunity to produce as much as possible, because they have the most amount of brood in that colony then. But then what happens, the bees start lowering how many they have. So they start preparing for winter time and shrinking their cluster, but these varroa mites, they still keep going up and they don't stop. 
So what happens is at some point they cross and the varroa mites become higher than the amount of bees that are in the colony. At that point, all the bees have mites on them and mites, they also like to spread viruses too, which is really detrimental to the colony. Um, they'll spread things like SBB, I think is what it's called. The bees will appear like a black, like greasy looking color and they'll also spread a small wing or a deform wing virus. So the wings will look all tattered and just really tiny and they won't be able to fly. Um, Uh-oh, lost my train of thought. Um, so yeah, that's why it's really important to treat in August because as they're doing that, so also right when the bees start to decrease how many bees are in that colony, that's also when they're preparing for winter. So there's summer bees and there's also winter bees. The difference is the summer bees have a smaller fat body, whereas the winter bees, they have that large fat body to help bring them through the winter time. That's what helps sustain them. Um, so if you have that varroa mite, then feeding on these winter bees, remember I said varroa mites feed on the fat body. They shrink that fat body. Now the bee has nothing to survive through winter on. So it ends up collapsing the whole entire colony and that's why it's such a huge problem. So in August, um, some of the treatments that you can use would be formic acid. That's the easiest thing for newbies to use because they just come as two pads that you would then put on your colony. Say these are pads. You put one on one corner and one on the other corner. Now you would want to do this right above where the brood box is. So you do it on the bottom box um, and then you leave it for, I believe it's 12 days. Now, the only drawback to this is there is a temperature range. So if it's above or even close to 85, it could possibly burn all your brood and your queen. So you have to be careful of that, yeah. <laughs> um, but a good thing about it is it's the only treatment that can actually penetrate the wax cappings, meaning it will be able to go into the brood cells itself and kill the row mites inside the brood cells. All the other treatments, they can only kill row mites that are on the bees. So the other treatments are oxalic acid. That's a little bit harder for a newbie to use just because you have to get like a vaporizing gun, which can be pretty expensive. It can be like $400 just to get something like that. But once you make that initial investment, it's super cheap because all the, uh, the oxalic acid itself usually comes in a big bag, like $20 and it'll last you a couple years. Um, that is my favorite just because it's not very harsh on the bees. It's very gentle. So you can put really high amounts into there. You can do it multiple times. And I've never noticed any like reduced brood production or bees dying or anything like that. Whereas some of the other treatments, they can cause some harm on the bees. Um, you can also use it with your honey supers on, which is great. Also with formic. That's a hard thing to come across because the other ones, they'll leave residues in your comb and in your honey. The other treatment you can use um, is Apivar. So that one is a chemical treatment. It comes as like two little strips that you would then dangle in between frames in your brood nest. And it has like um, a chemical oil or I wouldn't really call it an oil, but it has a chemical in it that the bees will then rub against it. And as they go throughout the colony and rub against other bees, then it passes it from bee to bee to bee. So all of them become coated in this. That's how it lowers the varroa mites. Now, I've used these personally, so my own experience. I've noticed there is some resistance building to it, and it doesn't work as good as some of the other organic acid treatments, like formic, oxalic acid, apigard, stuff like that. Um, so if you use it, definitely like run a trial on it and see what you think and if it ends up working for you. The other treatment you can use that I just mentioned is called apigard. So it comes as like a little, a little tray that you'll then put on top of your brood nest and it's like a gel and it becomes very stinky to the bees. So that's why they don't like it. They'll go to it and they'll try to start removing it. But as they're doing it, they're also becoming coated in this gel and passing it throughout the whole entire colony that way. Um, a lot of beekeepers like using this with a brood break also tied in, in with it. Oh, perfect, thank you. Yep. Yeah, so it looks like this. And you would just peel off this top part and like I said, put it on the brood nest. And yeah, so the bees will come to it, remove it, spread it throughout the whole entire colony. Now, what I was talking about with the brood break, a lot of commercial beekeepers will use this because this, this is like one of the things they swear by, um, is they will do a brood break and put this in there during it. And the reason I say a brood break is because it only kills mites on the bees. 
So if there's no brood in the colony, all the mites are on the bees. So all of the mites are gonna come in contact with this, with this and it's gonna completely get rid of them all. That's the theory with it. And then there's also thymol. I've never used it. It's derived yeah. from ox or thyme. Do you remember? Is it derived from thyme, thymol? I'm pretty sure it is, but I've never used it personally. So if you have any experience with it, definitely let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Um, now the other option that you will probably come across and it's what Casey and I do, and that is completely treatment free. So as a new beekeeper, personally, I would recommend to work into this. It's not something you can just jump into. It's something that you have to have a long-term plan for because you will have a lot of losses in the search for finding a treatment-free bee. Um, and you also have to be able to manage your bees correctly using brood breaks as well. Um, because in a brood break, when you, so let's explain what a brood break is. So if you were to perform a brood break on a colony, you would want to take the queen from that colony, put her in another hive, put her in a new box, if you wanted to go that route and create your own hive that way. Um, just so that you're taking the queen out of this hive. This hive will then create queen cells. If you want to make the most out of it, take the queen cells, create hives out of that. Okay, so now there's no queen cells in this hive. This hive only has brood in it and is hopelessly queenless. What's gonna happen is over the like two to three weeks, all of the brood is gonna, gonna emerge. During that time, all of the mites will then go on to the bees. So there's no more mites in the brood and there's no more brood in the colony whatsoever. So then you take either a mated queen or um, during that time, you could have put in a virgin queen to then have her go out on a mating flight and come back. But when that new queen starts laying again, all these mites that are on the bees, they're going to, in theory, bombard all of those cells and just try to start laying eggs like crazy because they haven't been in brood cells in like almost a month now. So what ends up happening is more mites per bee go into that, into all those, more mites per cell, sorry, go into all of those brood cells and there's not enough of the larva. So that's what they feed on in the brood cells is that little tiny bee larva. And when there's too much, too many mites in that cell, there's not enough food to go around. But now the, the cell gets capped. And so now they can't get out. So now they end up starving to death and that's how they would lower the, the mite levels. This is a theory that Mel, I think the book is still being passed around. Yep. So the beekeeper that wrote that book that I passed around, that is something that he's been talking about a lot. Um, I love a lot of the ways that he keeps bees. I think he just had a class we, here. We just had him here last Saturday. Okay. Yeah, he's been keeping bees for a really long time. Um, and I believe he's fully treatment free as well too. So he's definitely someone that's really good to look into. But that is who I've learned that theory from. And that's what we've been using ourselves. Um, I haven't been treatment free my whole time beekeeping, but Casey has. We joined all of our beekeeping operations together last year, and so far it's been going great. Um, one of my colonies, I have only treated twice over the whole entire course of its life. It's been five years now. And last year, no treatments whatsoever. And right now it's still keeping strong. So definitely excited to see, to see how that goes. But- When you do a brood break, say if you have a hive in the house, or are you doing that regardless of what <coughs> Yeah, good question. Um, so we would typically do it in July, no matter what. Usually I don't check for brood counts anymore just because I'm like, ah, that's a lot of work. Not really, not really a good use of my time. So yeah, we do it in July. The reason I say July is because that's right before they're going to start producing their winter bees. So you don't want to like interfere with that. But yeah, any other questions? No. I think that is pretty much it. I covered the bees, I covered the bees. I guess one more thing I could talk about is what kind of bees to get. Um, you'll see Italians, Carnolians, Russian bees, and then I'm also gonna talk about local mutts. I'll talk about that one last. So Italian bees is the most common that a lot of people will see. Um, that's usually what they recommend for beginners because they say they're the most gentle. Um, I like Italian bees a lot. They seem to produce a lot of honey. They produce a lot of brood as well. I've had most of my Italian hives, they'll have 
up to like three, four, five boxes sometimes, just completely jam packed. They're great. Personally, I think they overwinter the best out of um, between them and Carnolians. I haven't had the best of luck with Carnolians just because they don't seem to start slowing down their brood production. So they'll still keep producing all that brood and they'll just blast through all of their stores. Um, they act as if like winter's not even coming. Now, that's also dependent on where you're getting them from. So the reason I mentioned local mutts is because really you wanna look for bees that are local to your area because bees are adaptive to your local environment. It's really hard to kind of dictate, okay, this is an Italian, this is a Carnolian, unless you're artificially inseminating and completely controlling their mating process. Otherwise you can't, it's not like how dogs are where you can just say, okay, these two are mating together. This is the breed that it is. So you want to find a bee that can overwinter well, can do well with mites, knows your area and knows the different flows because depending on where you're located, the flows will be different. We have our main flow here in May, whereas down South, it can start in like April or March. It can start really early. So you want bees that are able to adapt to that. Now, Russians, a lot of people have given them a bad rap of being like super aggressive, but all the Russians that I've seen are actually really gentle. So again, it's just dependent on where you're getting them from. Um, I have noticed they will like to build out this really beautiful brood pattern. I'm starting to wonder if maybe there's a little bit of like Russian genetics, like in the history of the bees that I keep because anybody that I see that has like solely Russian bees, they have that same brood pattern. And it will be like almost like different colored like broods, uh, brood cappings. Yeah, it's so cool. And um, they'll always have that arc of honey on the tops of their frames. Whereas some other bees, they'll, they'll like make honey on the outside and then only have their brood, their brood nest like going like this. And then some bees will make their brood nest so it's only right here with honey on top. It's actually kind of funny how they choose to do it. I don't know what makes a bee do it one way or another. But I would suggest when you're looking for bees to find somewhere local, a beekeeper that you trust and start from there. But, so any questions? If not, then that will be, that's it. Isn't there a certain way you're supposed to set your hive? Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, yes. Um, so you want it to face southeast. That is the optimal way of doing it. That way they have the, when the sun starts to rise, it hits their, it hits the front of their hive and it wakes them up early. That way they get out and they start being productive as early as possible. Now, the best like location to put it is, I would say to put it on like the edge of like some woods or some trees, just because they're gonna have that, that morning sun that comes up and hits them but then they're gonna have some afternoon shade when it starts to get really, really hot during the day. So that'll help keep the hive cool. They'll help keep the moisture down too so they can help um, air out the cells because that's actually how they, they bring in nectar, but then there's water in that nectar. So then they have to fan it all around to get all that moisture out of the cells before they can then cap it and there's no more moisture left in the honey. Um, whereas if you put a hive in like the middle of like a field, I see a lot of people do that you have the sun constantly beating down on them. So it gets super, super hot. Or if you were to put a hive like in the middle of the woods, I've done that. Um, you'll have a really big problem with, uh, with uh, small hive beetles. Small hive beetles like it where it's cool and where it's dark. And so they'll come up out of the ground and they will just invade your hive like crazy. Um, so yeah, edge of a tree line, southeast. That'd be best. Okay, what about winter? Um, how yeah. How do you protect them from freezing? <laughs> yeah, so the bees do that themselves. You want to have a hive that has a pretty good size cluster. So say you're going into the winter and you have a hive that has like a cluster that's not very big. It's like only a softball size. Those bees will essentially freeze just because they don't have enough bees to keep warm. So the way they keep warm is they form this like really tight cluster as tight as possible and then they vibrate their bodies to keep warm. Um, so if they only have that small little bit, like I said, they won't be able to keep warm. So you want to have a hive that has a big brood nest, a lot of honey in there because they need the honey to give them energy. If they don't have honey, they won't be able to vibrate their bodies to keep warm so they could also freeze. And then the other thing would be moisture. So that's another big problem in hives. Um, 
the thing I like to use, I should have brought a little piece, but I like to use a little bit of like insulation foam, um, just the kind that comes in sheets you can get like at Lowe's or Home Depot. Cut it into the same size as your, as your hive. And then I like to get at least one inch. And the reason I like it is because the biggest problem with overwintering is when the hive is creating all of that heat, and the, the lid itself will get really, really cold just because the outside temps are hitting it, that will eventually clash and then form condensation right underneath the lid. So by putting that foam, that insulation foam down, it prevents any of those temperatures from clashing together. It just completely cancels it out. Now, some people use um, quilt boxes, and then, or you could also use wood chips. Um, I've never went that route just because I always thought that it brought moisture into the hive but a lot of people have a lot of success with them, as long as you have that upper entrance to help get rid of the moisture that would be collecting there. Um, so yeah, those are the main three things that you have to worry about going into winter. If all those things are good, then they can be super warm and no problems whatsoever. You can have the negative 20 degree days that we had even, and they will do just fine. You don't have to put a blanket around them and stuff on? No, you don't have to. Some people do. I've seen some people who like to use um, like the bee cozies and like put insulation around them. I have never used them. Casey used them and yeah, he's shaking his head. He's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, but like I said, every, everybody has their own methods and how they do things. So as you learn in your winter beekeeping journey, you'll find what works best for you. Um, so yeah, some people, They'll put it on, I think uh, Ryan Flannery, he's a big beekeeper. Um, I think he's probably been in a couple times, but he, he swears by those. But the, the trick with those is you have to do them after the first frost, I believe is what he said, just because otherwise you could trap moisture in the colony. That's the biggest concern with them because they don't really breathe very well. So you want to make sure you're not trapping that in. It also builds a, a false sense of security for the bees too, because once you wrap them, they're so warm, they're then they go out and do a cleansing flight and find out it's way too cold and once they get that air, they drop. Yep. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, this winter has been a hard one for the bees just because of how hot it's been and just the constant fluctuations. They don't really know what to do. Yeah, the cold won't kill the bees typically. It's getting wet and cold. Yeah. Yep. Yep, it's the fluctuations. Um, whenever they have to start breaking that that winter cluster that they form, you want them to stay in that cluster as long as possible. That's where they're going to be their strongest. <coughs> when they start breaking and start dispersing throughout the hive, if you give them a cold snap, it could possibly kill them because they're not all together. So, yeah. You mentioned having 80 pounds of honey to be enough for the winter. How do you decide, like, how much is 80 pounds? Um, I mean, you could weigh it, but no way is really going to do that. So what I usually do is I just go around the back of the colony. So this will be hard as a new beekeeper just because you have to learn what it feels like. When I first started beekeeping, I'd go around to the back and if I couldn't lift it at all, I knew I was 100% okay. Typically, if you have a whole entire deep box, so not this super, but another one of these bigger boxes on top of it, as long as it's full of honey, you're good. They will honestly even have extras the following year. Okay. Um, once you start getting more experience with beekeeping, you could also overwinter with just a medium and even just this deep box. But I would suggest starting with the deep box first, just so you start to learn how to do it. Because the most important thing is to get bees through the winter. That's the hardest thing. So that's what you want to do first and master that. What causes them to come out on a cold, sunny, winter day when there's, and then they die on the snow? Um, in the neighborhood, all the bees came out and they, then they were dead on the snow. After the, the winter sun? bee die off, basically. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. know they're dying, so they try to leave the hive. Is that what it yeah. is? Yeah. It could also be, um, so there's going to be winter die off of just the summer bees. They will all die as the winter bees take over the colony. And they'll all be on that bottom board. So a lot of times you lift off the hive and see a ton of dead bees there. So it could also be they're dragging them out too, just kind of getting rid of them since it's warm enough for them to do that. So. Or they could be diseased. Could be diseased too. Yeah, the bees, they're very selfless. They care more about the colony. That's their main purpose is to make sure the colony keeps going. So if they have a disease, they will leave so the rest of the colony doesn't get sick. Or they have scum and they think they're leaving all the mites behind and they're actually taking them with them and then, yep. and they die. Yep. 
that's another big problem. Um, if you ever see like bees that just randomly leave the hive, that's what absconding means in the fall times, a lot of times it's because they had really high mite levels. Yeah, any other questions? Or hornets chase them out. Or yeah. hornets? Oh, really? I haven't had that problem yes. yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yikes. <laughs> With the warm days in um, this month, have, have you seen your hives? Have they been going out active looking for flowers and stuff? Or? Um, some of them, some of them not. So my main ones that I've had, um, so I had my main OG hive is what I call it, and I bred a lot of queens off of her. Most of her genetics, they're all staying in that nice tight cluster, even on these warm days. That's been blowing my mind and it makes me so happy. But then we have other bees that we brought in from outside genetics and those were, yeah, they were definitely spreading out. They were going out and looking, um, just, yeah, <laughs> not really the best thing. You will still have bees leave the colony, even if they're a good hive, just so they can, um, they can alleviate their, their cells. So they don't want to go to the bathroom in the colony. Bees actually use the bathroom. <laughs> and so they'll want to do what's called cleansing flights in the winter time, as soon as it's warm enough to do that. So you'll see like specks on the ground or like even like on a spring day, if you're wearing white, you're going to have bee poop all over you. <laughs> Especially if you have a white bee suit, just a warning. I don't know why we have white bee suits. I don't know why we picked that. They're always so dirty. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yep. Now I've seen uh, some hives that have spigots on them so that they you can draw the honey oh. out. Oh, I the flow is hive. That a, is that a real thing or is that just a... That really is a expensive. real thing. Yeah, yeah, they're really expensive. I've never used them personally, so I have no idea how they work. Um, from other beekeepers that have, they say it's a little bit more complicated than a normal hive um, just to have them draw it out. But yeah, they're just little... They're frames that have the cells already built and then you just use like a key kind of thing and you turn it and it'll end up dripping out of the hive into a jar. So in theory, it seems awesome, but uh, do your research first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ship from Australia. Any other questions? Uh, is it better to put them by water source if you have that on your property? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fine. Um, I wouldn't put them too close just because in the winter time or the fall time, there will be moisture coming off of that water source and it could potentially go into the colony and make them, make them uh, the humidity level go up, which is a big problem. Um, but you could definitely put them like, I don't know, 100 feet back or even just like a little bit further just so they have access to it. Okay. And they say a half a mile yeah. radius for water source. Oh, is it half a yeah. mile? Okay. Yeah, they don't like to do it too close to their hives so like even if you plant flowers you want it to be so far away because they'll draw in they'll draw in like predators so if, if the bees are coming in and out other things will see them and then they'll attack their hives so in nature they like to go out 100 you know 100 yards or whatever find a flower or water source and then they're able to like lose the predator before they get back to the hive so it's a way of protecting them because my first few years i put a bunch of flowers up like right next to my hives and they would fly 300 yards that way and go to other flowers but never touch the flower so you, you kind of want to give them that distance oh, oh that's cool okay yep I know too, if you end up doing um, that drone frame I passed around, that's good feed for them. So if you end up doing that for Roa mites, then just feed that drone that drone frame to them and they will eat it up, all the larvae. Yeah, yeah. How tall do you, when do you know when to add? Oh, that's a good question too. So the first mistake I made when I first started beekeeping is I was always nervous that they wouldn't that they would need more space, so I just kept throwing boxes on there before they were ready. You want to make sure that they're literally almost bubbling out of that box to the point that they need space before you add on another box. If you add it on too soon, it's going to be more space for them to control, and also it's going to be harder for them to control the, the temperature of the hive itself too. So you want them to literally, like I said, be bubbling out before you add on another box. Can I interject something? Yeah. If you're, um, for the new beekeepers, like with your first honey scooper, if you let the, uh, keep the queen excluder off, let her lay a little bit up in the honey, um, honey box, it'll draw them up there. And from there, when you put the second honey box on, you can checkerboard them because they, they don't count it as space. So like, if you just throw it on, they'll jam pack their bottom box full of honey and then it, they'll 
uh, they'll leave because they'll basically split themselves. But um, so by letting her like lay eggs up in that first honey super a little bit, it draws them up there. They'll start to take care of it. And then you can put the honey, uh, the queen excluder on, push her back down, and then let them draw out the rest of the flames and the frames, and they'll take that box as an actual like part of their hive. And then from there, you can keep using those uh, super frames to keep them moving up into other boxes. Yep. Yep. Checkerboarding is a huge thing. I didn't even find that until like my third year. So what checkerboarding is is say you have an empty frame and then you have. Um, like a brood frame or a drawn frame, you can then put an empty frame right in between their brood nest and they will draw this out so fast because they do not like empty space in the middle of their brood nest. Um, I will say I would only put it in between brood frames though. And the reason I say this is because a honey frame, they can draw out that cell as far as they want to. They're kind of, bees are really productive, but they can also be lazy. And if they can just keep drawing that out instead of drawing out another frame, then they will. <laughs> Whereas a brood frame, they can only draw it out so far, otherwise it messes up their baby bees and their brood. So how much property do you need to start something like this? Honestly, even a half an acre. Just enough to put your bees on it, because the bees, they'll go everywhere around you to go find honey and nectar, or nectar and pollen sources. Okay. okay, we're in a subdivision, okay. Okay. and I'm on a half an acre. Okay. Um, what about liability for neighbors that may be allergic to bee stings and stuff like that. What if they're cutting the grass on the corner of their backyard and all of a sudden they're getting stung? So how do you manage my Yeah, you gotta prove it. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, you probably have honey bees you, you, can, <laughs> you, uh, yeah. Uh, you can train well, their flight path. So like um if you put like a hive like that, if it was sitting there in your yard you can put a wall in front of it, so they have to come out and then they have to come up. Yep. So they'll they'll always come out, they'll come up and then they'll stay like say six feet above the ground, seven feet, so they'll always fly above your head. However, if they can come straight out, they'll fly right into your chest. But you can actually, they can, they'll learn and they'll come like this and then they'll train all the other bees. You can take that away and they'll always do that. And it'll keep them out of your basic face area. Yep. Also, I just would make sure you don't put the hive right next to your property line so that it's not facing them when they're mowing their lawn too. If it's like, say like the hive's right there and like they're mowing their lawn over here, like they're not gonna care. Those bees, they could care less. It's when you get really close to them with that, they will not like it. So just try to keep it far away from them. I know some subdivisions too, or some cities, they require you to have permission from all your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Don't know what the problem is. If you need a permit, check with each other. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Something to look into. <laughs> How many hives do you plan on having? Like, for, is this your first year? One, yeah. I'm not even sure if I'm going to have one. I'm just here for information. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> right now, I'm uh, just interested. Because yeah, a lot nice. of the cities, um, because like people will put like five or six on top of building rooftops now, and they'll drive local pollinators out. Because honeybees are technically an invasive species. I, I know that we like to love them and cuddle on them and whatnot but they're not meant to be here like we have natural pollinators and when you put like say we put 80 hives in an area if we take those 80 hives out we just crush the pollinators in that area and honeybees are very good at like what they do so they will push everything else out and then when you pull your bees out everything that they were supporting will collapse in the area and that'll make it even worse so like you have to be really like Beekeeping, a lot of people give up in the first three years, but it's really a five to 10 year plan if you don't want to hurt the environment. So like, once you put them there, you're going to take care of them for life if you care about the environment. Now you can slowly weed them out and let the natural ones come back, but you have to be careful with like running out the natural pollinators. Well, I've heard that uh, we're losing our bee population. And that um, is one reason why I'm here. Not honeybees, uh, bumblebees and so oh. the bumblebees are actually more expensive than honeybees and they actually do a better job pollinating but they don't have the secondary product of honey that a lot of the beekeepers push for you know like if you can get pollen and honey it's more worth it than just getting the pollen but bumblebees technically pollinate better and there's an entire different section of beekeeping for uh, bumblebees but you can keep bumblebees too okay. mostly pumpkin farmers yep yep 
you also just piggybacking off the uh, beekeeping is like a five to ten year thing. So most beekeepers don't make it past their first three years because a lot of beekeepers, I mean all of us when we start something new, we want to master it as soon as possible. And the whole reason we're starting beekeeping is because we want a challenge, we want something that's going to be different than what we're doing from day to day. And beekeeping definitely, definitely tests that. It is definitely a challenge. Um, you may lose bees in your first three, four, even five years. That's just a whole part of the process and you're gonna make a ton of mistakes. Honestly, you won't really become like a really good beekeeper until you start getting to your fifth year. We usually say like you're not an actual beekeeper until you've been beekeeping for five years. Just because there's so much to learn in the whole entire entire course of your beekeeping journey. You're just a bee haver until then. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you should be proud. Yeah, <laughs> yeah be, be yeah. proud to be a bee haver until you make it to beekeeper. Yeah. I think it's important to join a club and find a mentor. Yes. Especially if you're new at it, you really yes. need someone to just show you a few hive inspections and mm -hmm. things yep. to look out for and that. It's nice to have somebody to ask questions to. Tons yes, of bee clubs around. That's a game changer for sure. Yeah. We go to the... River Raisin, yeah, that's the one we that's the one yeah, we're we we're a part of. Adrian, if you're close by to that. Second Sunday of every month. Club. Wonderful club, yep. wonderful club. Or you can go on Facebook and find out when they are. Yes, they yes. have a newsletter on there too. So, yep. <coughs> and there are other where Chelsea Second, and Arbor, Sunday, and almost every. Yep. Yeah. Clubs everywhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, there's one in Hillsdale at uh. I forget the name of it now. Um, Lost Nation. Lost Nation, yes. Lost Nation, yes. There's one in Hillsville at Lost Nation. That one's pretty decent. Cool. All right, any other questions? <clears throat> okay, for for some of us that are wintering over for the first time, yep. and we know that the varroas are in there all winter, you know, multiplying, yep. are there guidelines for when to start testing for that and when to start treating? Like, how soon do you start? Because you don't want that to interfere with the honey flow or you know their health and them brooding up you know to get their population for the honey flow so i've never heard anybody say anything they go well they build up and then no, you... yep. Yep, okay definitely. they build up and that's it you know yep. you don't hear anything so yeah that's a great do you question. have any tips for people that are overwhelming bees that <laughs> um so personally i've only ever treated in the fall time um, my theory with it was, is so the bees, they go through that broodless period from, I believe it's December and January, and they start producing brood again in February. And during that broodless period, that's going to take a lot of mites out. Also, mites don't like the cold. So I don't know how they appear every year into our colonies. I don't know where they're coming from, how they hibernate. We honestly need to learn more about that. Um, but the mite levels definitely go down in the colony during the winter time. So yeah, I've, I've never treated in the spring. I've never had any problems with it. Now, it would be beneficial to check though, just for peace of mind. Um, I would wait until your colony starts growing in size though. So probably like April-ish. I would say it would be a good time. So you don't want to take out too many of their bees right now. I'm going to be treating all 21 of mine on Monday. Yeah, I should yep. say you want to treat them in the like you want to treat them in the winter when they're bee What are you treating with them? Well, that's Boy. what are you treating Boy. with? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's another option. When they're during that broodless period I just talked about, just do one blast of OA with a, an OA gun, mm -hmm. and they'll take out all of the mites that were on the bees. The phoretic mites. Yep, all the phoretic. What's phoretic? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are on the bees and not in the cell. Because you what, have phoretic. What are they called inside the cell? I actually don't know. I okay. just like the word phoretic. Just, okay, all right. <laughs> I really like the word phoretic. I like phoretic. it too. I like it too. But it, it just rolls off the tongue. That's the one I always forget too. But there is a word for it. Huh? There is. I'll, there I'll is. look at it. I'll Google it. Then. Okay. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Okay. But I'm like, okay. But it's just like it just seems like like when we go through, they you get to that part and then they it just like drops off and you're like, okay, well, good luck with that. Yep. <laughs> No, I would definitely check. I've, like I said, I've never had a, had to, the need to do it. They've always done just fine. Well, so you gotta watch to your temperature see. too, because when you pull the brood out, you don't want to chill it and kill it. So you gotta have the right temperature to check that. Oh, I yeah. wouldn't dig into it. Like you just like if you're gonna. If you're gonna treat it, it's just gonna be a blind treatment. Okay. You're yeah. just okay. gonna. All right. Yeah. That's what I want to know. Blind yeah. No. Treatment. You you don't dig into it. You okay. just. Yeah. You just you're just gonna blind treat it and hope for the best, and then. Yeah. Yeah. And don't. Then sixties during the day or night. For like three or four days in a row. Okay. Like you want like a good span of it because if you do it and then they get all crazy and then the next day it drops to negative five, you just hurt them really bad. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you want to plan it with like a two or three day gap. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
guess I can mention that too for new beekeepers. Um, so the biggest thing for new beekeepers is to get as much hands-on experience as possible. So honestly, going into your hive every single week just to get that hands-on experience would be great for a new beekeeper. Now, once you've been beekeeping for a while, I wouldn't suggest it just because you are tearing into their hive, so they do better when you're not in it as much. But in order for you to learn, you need hands-on experience. That's also why it's good to have a couple hives, just so then you don't have to tear into each one each time. Um, and also taking notes. That is huge. I always forget what happened in the hive previously, so even um, using like, you could use something like a piece of masking tape that you put over it and say you have like some sort of like numbered code or like letter code, like okay, L for lane queen or like V for virgin queen, just to kind of remind you what was going on. I think this looks familiar. Oh, you printed these. Yes. Or I have a hive data sheet. <laughs> yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to update it for 2024. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so I have this on my website um, as a free download. I think it, it was on my website, right? I it was. I didn't see it the other day, though. Okay, I'll have to make sure it's still up then. Um, but yeah, I can pass this around too. So it has a column for queen status, frames of bees, frames of honey, temperament, so if they're angry or not, disease comb drawing, might count, brood pattern, and then other actions performed and notes and stuff like that. Um, I always like to keep an eye on just like the temperament. So like with Italian bees, I've noticed they have something called F2 aggression, meaning once they requeen with their second queen, sometimes they'll be insanely aggressive. Those are the bees I've seen more aggressive than any other bees I've ever had in my life. They will be like super nervous on the comb, they'll chase you across the yard. <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah, if you ever have that problem, just make the colony requeen again and it will most likely resolve itself. Um, but there are also some other genetics of bees that could just have that in their genetic line where they're kind of aggressive and you wouldn't really want that. You'd want to pinch the queen and put a new queen in there. Um, I guess from a new beekeeper perspective too, as you're learning how aggressive the bees can be, um, in my first couple years, I would sometimes think, oh, this hive is super aggressive. Not even thinking that, hey, this is fall time all of the nectar and pollen sources are going down so they're like us they get cranky when they're hungry so they're going to start being a lot more agitated during that time and that wouldn't mean that you have an aggressive hive it's just that time of year they get a little more aggressive so this might be a dumb question but like with little kids around yep. where like are they gonna chase my kids all the way across the yard <laughs> no, if, they're, no, no, if no. my kids are way down there and my hive is way up here like are they gonna like seek out my kids or is no, it no. just like if my kids are right up on the hive no so it's only going to be if you're in their hive and you're messing with them that's when they'd get kind of agitated if they were like an aggressive type but if you're not even touching their hive and you're just minding your own business they're going to also mind their business okay um i have seen though if you were just in your hive and you notice they're really really aggressive i wouldn't let your kids go anywhere near the area for a couple hours for them okay. to calm down because it takes a minute for that to happen okay and always work in either behind or outside your hive. Yeah, that too. Um, I would definitely not work from the front because then they will just start pouring out if they're aggressive <laughs> at you. So. And that's also why the smoke is good. So bees, they release a pheromone. They, they work off entirely of pheromones. So they can release um, an alarm pheromone. That's what will happen when you crack open the hive. And it'll take a minute to completely disperse throughout the entire hive. But as the alarm pheromone disperses, they'll get more and more aggressive. But the smoke, it masks those pheromones, so it's not passed around the colony, and it keeps them in a state of calm. You get stung, smoke the sting, too, yeah. because that stops the pheromones. And Because what they're saying is, come help me, yep. we, we're being attacked. Yep. And yep. that's another good reason people smoke is going. Yep, just, uh, just in case. Oh. Yeah, it's been a minute. I forgot we were actually doing that. Yeah, always use the same stuff in your smoker. I'm just saying, if you use leaves, always use leaves because the bees get used to your smell with the smoker. So, like, yeah. with ours, we only use a certain type of leaf, and then, or she uses t shirts every once in a while. So, if you change it up and then say go to pine needles, you just completely change the smell of who you are to them. Oh. So now they, they, they can still recognize you, but it's a different to them, it's a different scent. Yeah. So even though they want to be calm, they're still like, what's going on here? Yeah. So like you can use the same smoke and a lot less of it each time mm -hmm. to get your, like the results you want. Mm -hmm. Also, I'll say if you are your first year, mm -hmm. if you can afford it, buy two mm -hmm. colonies outright. Do not buy one. Yeah. You, you can't tell where a star is in the sky without a second star. 
you know so you can't tell what's going wrong with this beehive if you don't have a good beehive to look at and if this beehive does go bad you can always save it with a second hive so if you want to have a better chance of success spend the extra money and just get two setups yep. like it's a waste of time to just buy one set of bees buy two and if one thing goes wrong in one colony you can take from the strong one to make them a little bit the weak one a little bit stronger that also helps what is your website? Uh, beefitbeekeeping.com. Can I have cards? Does anybody want the card? I think everyone. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah, it is. That's honestly how I learned. I didn't even have a mentor. I've just, I've now found them over the years, but yeah, YouTube's huge. I don't know how I got my dad. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Say one more thing. You just have to be careful who you watch and okay. where you're located at because then people yeah, that me towards it will hold you up here. Oh, my goodness, yeah. <laughs> Can I interject one more thing? I see everybody has like there's a lot of kids here if you keep your bee suit next to your children or say like you got your child in the car and you throw your bee suit in the back next to them after you go check your bees or whatever you can give your children allergies by by simply being too close to your bee equipment without them getting stung they can actually build up they can build up an allergic reaction from um the bee equipment itself so if your children are going to be around them and they can handle it it's not bad to sting them every once in a while no, like good. get a bee hold them down and just sting their arm just so you and i mean it's not terrible but like that way you know it, 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 <laughs> yeah but i mean make sure you get them tested to make sure they're not allergic or anything yeah. like that but it helps the venom helps keep them from gaining a small allergy that can turn into a big allergy over time that's actually how a lot of beekeepers do become allergic it's just being in contact with all those bee oh. particles and never getting because your body produces white blood cells, and that's what will make it so that you don't become allergic to it. But if your body's never producing those white blood cells and you get stung, if you're not getting stung, then yeah, you'll you'll end up eventually becoming allergic to them. So you want to get stung? Yes, been, you do. I've been yes. stung a thousand yep. times in five but years. But maybe not as much as Casey likes to get stung. He goes into hives without a bee suit on. <laughs> so he'll get stung like a hundred times, not even, not even joking a little bit. Fun story. <laughs> so fun story. Um... My first year, I bought three hives outright because I, like I said, I'd done some research and said everybody was saying don't get one. So I bought three and I got stung by every one of them. And I noticed one hurt more, one hurt less. But one, when I got stung by it, made my knees stop hurting, made my elbows stop hurting. I felt like five years younger and I was like, cool. And it was a little bit of a more aggressive hive. So I just kind of separated off to the side. And every once in a while, I would just kind of give it a kick and let it sting me. And then it got to the point where... I had to be stung at least like two or three times a week, but it was my own version of what? Apothe ap apotherapy. That is a legit thing. Like if you can, like, so, like the thing is, if you, if I'm, a, I'm a believer that bees, you get the bees you raise, right? So the reason I never used a bee suit was because if I'm not used to them stinging me or if I'm not like that, then I'm going to have bees that you always need a bee suit with. But as a first year, you should wear a bee suit. But I eventually worked all my bees into by breeding ones that didn't sting me or the ones that didn't hurt when they stung me, that I can go get stung, what, I think 30 times is my best in a single hit. Um, and I don't even swell up. But I, I picked bees that were best for my personal genetic, like my body type. Like, so when I get stung, it either helps me with my like joints or I don't get any reaction at all. Yep. However, when I went to her bees the first time, like I swelled up like a balloon. I was like, Ooh. Yep. you know so like you should definitely like make a checklist of the kind of bees you want and then go for those because beekeeping is a process you might buy so say you buy what you guys sell nukes right nukes so you packages. say you buy two nukes packages and you buy two nukes here right and you keep them alive to the third fourth fifth year by the time you get to your third and fourth year with those bees they're basically what you want them to be like especially if you learn how to split if you learn how to uh manage them so say that you have three colonies and you know this one's kind of aggressive but this one is a little more aggressive but when it stings you it doesn't hurt so you breed off that one so the next year you have more of those ones and then you find the daughters of hers that aren't so aggressive but you still get the benefit of the sting mm -hmm. so now you're working on the secondary benefit and then each year you pick a new benefit and you just kind of make three or four hives and condense them down like 
and then that next year you pick the queen you make three four hives out of her pick her best daughters and then by year five you have a really solid genetic line not that the lines aren't genetically solid when you buy them because he sells great bees honestly he sells great bees but it's localizing them and then localizing them to yourself Eventually, they basically become Michigan mutts. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. But they're your mutts. Like, that queen will mate, you know, six, seven, eight, ten times yep. in her flight. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they uh, mate with multiple different drones, not just the one on their flight. Is there so an they... average life span for a bee? Yeah, so for summer bees, they usually last, I believe, it's six weeks. I believe it's six weeks. Well, yeah. um, and then in the winter time, they can last for up to six months at a time, depending on where you're from. If you're up in like a more northern area, then six months. Um, that way they're able to actually like keep going and the hive doesn't collapse because they got too old. The queen can last. I've heard some people even having a queen for three years. Um, we personally try to do a new queen every single year just because we find the most productivity that way. But you can definitely keep a queen for a while, for sure. Yeah. Now they will get a little more swarmy though, if you do have an older queen. Just because she's been in that colony, they've already established, so their main purpose is to spread their genetics everywhere they can. So that's why they swarm, so they can put their bees somewhere else and just keep spreading them around. Yep. But beekeeping is fun. Um, I will say, I will warn you, once you start, it becomes an addiction. And you always say, oh, it's just gonna be two hives. And then it'll be five, and then 10, and then 25. And you're like, oh my gosh, why, did I, why do I have so many bees? But it, it's a lot of fun. I think an EpiPen is a good thing to have because you can it go is. from being not allergic to them at all to anaphylaxis in one stink. Mm -hmm. Or even being stung too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what I was it Paul Walker said? Thing. If they take me out, I'd die doing what I love. <laughs> oh my gosh. Something along Don't let him fool you. He was getting headaches, so. Oh yeah. He's wearing a bee suit this year. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think because I the first year I was, if you kind of look back, like I think at least two or three people die from their own hives every year. In fact, last year in Indiana, the right down from where I work, they had, I think it was like seven or eight pallets laid out. And uh, one of the farmers who wasn't the owner of the property, he was just a farmer, had drove through to mow and smashed through all the pallets not knowing he did it. Well, now you have six pallets all coming after this farmer and before he could even get off the tractor they had swarmed and mobbed him and killed him um the there was a girl that made it in the newspaper she had picked up one of her hive bodies like this and it slipped out of her hand a little bit and she dropped it she leaned over to get it and when it hit ten thousand bees came up into her face neck chest she wasn't wearing a suit dead yeah. so you have to be really careful you do recommend getting a suit. I recommend getting a good one. I bought a uh, cheap one off of Amazon, like the $30 ones, and they can sing you through that. 100%. It is pointless. Literally pointless. Um, these suits are great. This, these are the ones that actually I use. I like the two-piece. The only thing about the two-piece is if you bend over and then like it slides up, they can get you in the back or the butt, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind about that. But the round veils, that's personally my favorite, just so that you can see everything at all times. Best advice I ever got was sweat goes down, bees go up. So yep. if it's going up, it's a bee. But if it's going down your back, it's probably sweat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It happens a lot. I don't know how they get in, but they find a way sometimes. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Okay. 
oh, it becomes sturdy. So the bees, they produce something called propolis, and it's pretty much glue. And so they glue everything together. That's why you'll need a high tool like this, just to even get your frames out, to even move this box off this bottom board, you'll have to put it underneath and crack it open, just because they seal every single little nook and cranny in that hive. So yeah, it becomes very sturdy. And it's all the way to the honey too, it keeps it very, just if there's wind, it's not going to blow all over it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that fully. Yeah. If, if there's nothing in it, then yeah, I would put like something on top of the lid until they propolize everything down. If like you were just then starting in the spring time. Um, yeah, once they get it going, it's good to go. <laughs> oh, I didn't cover that. Yeah, so I personally like doing wax dip the most. It's just the only thing is where do you get wax dip hives? That's the thing. Um, it's really expensive to do, so to have like your own wax dipping operation, that would be really hard. There are some commercial beekeepers that will open it up to the public during certain days. You can go for those days. Um, but yeah, they last the absolute longest. Um, they look the best too. Um, the other option I'd say is painting. I usually use a solid, a solid stain because it's a paint and stain together, and it also has primer in it and it seals it and everything. That's what I like to use. Um, in terms of just using like a semi-transparent stain, though, I they don't last very long. Mine are starting to fall apart. That I use that on, they started to get like mold and whatnot. And even um, what are they called? What are those wax dip hives you can buy online right now? The Hoovers? Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to like put them on blast or anything, but I've gotten a couple of hives from them and you have to wax them every single year. I don't know what they use, but they start to degrade very, very fast. So yeah, paint or wax dip from- Or another thing hives. now is heat on dip them. It's a natural mineral. Is that what they're using? That's right, so using uh, oh, okay. How do you do it? So how do you, it, how do you, you just dip them? In, it's a solution to mix with water, mm. and you just soak it for 10 seconds, and it's done. So you just have like a big, huge tote that you're putting them in? Okay. Nope. Once you seal it, it's done. Yeah, I would be interested to see if there's like a way you can do it on a smaller scale. Yeah, that'd be nice. I know you have to, for actual wax, you have to heat it up to a certain temperature really hot, so it's kind of hard to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. I have a question. <laughs> if you had to start over, what's the one thing you would change? Oh, if I had to start over. I don't know. I don't think I've changed any of it. Because even all the mistakes I've made, I've learned so much from it. Now, I will say the only mistake I, the biggest mistake I made that set me back, but we wouldn't have met had I not made that mistake. <laughs> yeah, so not last year, but the previous year. I wanted to expand. I really like had the itch with bees. And I was like, hey, I'm going to expand to like 30 colonies. I had already grown to, I think it was like, well, actually, I think I was trying to grow even more. I think I was to 25 at that time. And I made up all of these little five frame nuke boxes. So you can actually overwinter bees in a five over five, five over five setup. That's how Casey overwinters all of his bees. Um, in the springtime, they're just booming because they've been in that small cluster the whole time. But so I came across Mike Palmer's video. He talks about that and how beneficial they are because you can just use them to plug into your big colonies for any sort of like dead outs you have. So you always have like backup bees to put in without having to buy them. And so I was like, hey, I'm going to do this too. But I didn't find this video until August. So I decided, hey, I'm going to do it anyways and I'm going to just make it work. Yet, yeah, no, the bees were not able to draw out the comb. They were not able to build up any any sort of stores whatsoever. Um, also, it was the first time I was ever woodworking on my like just by myself. So I didn't really build the boxes the best way. So there was like moisture getting in. We're still having problem with those boxes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd say that's my just my biggest thing. The bees they work in timing and with like the weather and the time of year that it is. They even work off of the sun. That's why I say July is the best time for a brood break. Because as soon as the days start getting shorter, that's when they're like, hey, winter's coming. We're going to start preparing now. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that would just be the only thing I would change. But we would have never met had I had not done that. That was the video I met you because of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Because I was like, hey, you're going to need queens. Yeah. Well, because you did that same experiment the year prior, and you were like, oh, that's not going to go very well. And yeah, it didn't work for me or her, so it's probably not going to work for anybody else. But yeah, I wouldn't do any splits past in Michigan past the like second or third week in July. Don't do them. Don't do them. Even like walk away splits, I wouldn't do them past the first week of July. Just because of how long it takes them to build them up and then have the queen come back. So if you have that post summer solstice queen, no, she'll lay until November. That is huge. Yeah, that's important, having a post summer solstice queen. So when she's born into the part of the year where the days are getting shorter, she just goes crazy because she thinks she's behind. So she'll start laying as many eggs as possible to build up that colony. And the alpha bees won't let her stop either. So. Nope. Yep, we like to use that a lot. We haven't yet. We want to though. This year, this year, yeah. no matter what, we got yeah. some major yeah, school. Did you catch any last yep. year? Yep, sure did. Awesome. Okay. Did you use a swamp commander? From what I was told, that if you catch a, if you catch, more than likely, if you catch a hive in a swarm trap. As long as you keep in that location, you'll catch them in that same spot year yep. after year after year. Like they'll, really? yeah, that's like they'll come to that same trap year after year after year. You can almost guarantee it after you figure it out. Yeah. So once you find the spot, you'll get them. So if you had, if you had a, bees from one of your neighbors swarm to your house in one spot, that's where you put the swarm trap. Yeah, yeah. that's where. Yeah. I would. You, Depends on where they swarm that in there. Say that again. Depends on where they swarm to. Uh, they land on a house or a tree in your yard or in my house. In your house. On the corner of my house. <laughs> but I had them. Oh. I had them land in a tree at my other house. Okay. You somebody come and get them. Yeah. You might be able to stop them from like, doing that by putting a swarm box up. If you give them a good home, like right in the area, they might stop trying to go to that or that and just go to the swarm box itself. Yeah. And then when they go in there, then you just take them out, sell them, whatever you can do with they them, will, keep them. They will move to three different places before they call it three-place homes. Yes. Yep. And that's also the purpose of uh, the lemongrass oil or uh, the swarm commander is it'll attract them. So it mimics their swarm pheromone itself. and will bring them to that area. You can also... You. <laughs> so if we ever see a swarm somewhere, we can just call you guys? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I'll take you it. definitely can. I got yeah. a list on them. Back here, full of names. That oh, call. oh, okay. Or even just uh, bees living in the side of someone's house. We did our first two cutouts last year. Mm. One of them was insane. Not even kidding. From oh. like here to like almost the ceiling, just full. It was like all the way out to here of bees. It ended up being two colonies side by side. It was insane. I did my first. I did catch a swarm. Well, I got called to a swarm. Um, it was a. I have video of it, but it was huge. Like it filled up a five frame nuke and then some, but it landed on this girl's tree. And I don't know if they were trying to fly again and a bird got the queen, but the queen ended up with an injured wing and on the ground and all the bees moved from up onto the ground. So when I got there, they're in a big pile on the ground and I just like took a scoop up with like a frame and I put it in the thing. Just luckily I got the queen with that scoop and the moment they realized the queen was in the box, you can just watch the whole video. Oh, yeah. It's a pile of bees just go. Big old marching in. Right, marching oh, in is the coolest thing you'll ever see. Wherever the queen is, they follow. Yep. Do you call that lemongrass oil? Lemongrass oil. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Anybody got swimming pools? Sure, they, like water. They, they will if you have a swimming pool um they will good luck <laughs> good luck there's like um there's like a essential oil i want to say peppermint oil peppermint oil around the rim of your swimming pool will keep them out of your swimming pool peppermint oil also works for small hive beetles in the hive too. yes um but that was a problem we had at one of our yards early on was we had a swimming pool and the kid like even if it's just a little kiddie pool and your kids are playing in it, they will flock to it. Yeah. But if you, um, the thing about it is too, like, so I establish a water source with a kiddie pool and um, I use random stuff for them to float in the kiddie pool and they know that's their spot. Now, if somebody was to go over and dump it, then they no longer have that source, then they go to my pool. 
and that's a problem. So once they, so once they go to the actual water source that is theirs and it's easy for them, you're good. But if anybody moves it or if it goes dry, they will then go to your pool or whatever water source they can get to. Okay. Depends on do you is it just pure water in the pool or is yeah. it well, so like, it's like a, any chlorine? Any chlorine? No, okay, okay. So no chemicals because they will draw right to the chlorine because they use it to like in their hive. Mm -hmm. So okay. they will actually go to that. But if it, you're talking about like, yeah, like yeah. but like a kiddie pool, they should be fine. Um, if the creek is, uh, but like I said, you have to be so far away from it, or they'll just go to whatever keeps them the safest. So, like, if you put it right next to your creek, they won't use the creek. They'll go farther. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you can put, like, a, you float a little thing in the creek with some little chlorine in it and some water, and then they'll go there, and then they'll melt. They're trainable. They're almost like a dog. They're trainable. I go 100 yards from any source that I want them to go to. So, like, yeah. Like, if you... Because my first... I, I spent, like, five, six $600 just planting flowers one year. Like, like, my second year, and I put my hives right next to it, and then they literally flew over my flowers to go to where flowers 100 yards away. So, you, like, they won't go if it's too close. Because of their... Uh, the waggling. If it's within 100 yards, they can't do a waggling. So they can't actually explain to the other bees where it's at. So at after 100 yards, then they can do their little wagon. Okay.